Uh, for more on this, uh, let's welcome in, shall we? Nikki Bandini joins us. Uh, Don's still with us as well. Nikki, where do we start? Milan getting the win or Juventus being terrible? It's a good question. I think a lot of people are probably more focused right now on, on Juventus because we expect more of Juventus, because Juventus are forever the club of winning isn't an important thing. It's the only thing that counts, and they haven't been winning for a while. Um, I think there was so many sort of shocking numbers that you could draw out of this this result, this position there in the table. But the one that really jumped out to me is since Max Allegri came back to Juventus just over a year ago, he hasn't had a single win over Inter, over Milan, or over Napoli. So the three teams you think of as the big beasts at the top of the division, the big rivals, he hasn't managed to beat them even once. And that's including Supercoppa, Coppa Italia, where they played Inter a couple more times last season. These big games, he just hasn't been able to make any of them go his way. Where's it gone so wrong for Allegri, Don? Well, you can point to one or two injuries. You can, you can point to uh, Federico Chiesa being injured, but you knew that at the start of the season. Paul Pogba, same boat. Um, I still look at Juve and, and listen, Dan, when I sit here with my football and eyes on, you've got to be careful sometimes when you criticise someone like Max Allegri, who's done and won most things in the game. But I look at Juve and I never see Juventus as a 4-4-2 and I never see Adrian Rabio playing as a left winger in a 4-4-2. Never, ever. In my opinion, they're a 4-3-3 side. But they're bland, Dan. They're not a good side to watch. Locatelli came from Sassuolo as a, as a, as a number eight midfield player that scored, got, scores goals. Does the same for Italy. You know, he plays him in a deeper role. Um, Rabiot, all right, he got a couple of goals last week in the Champions League, but he doesn't score goals neither. The service into Blavich is nowhere near good enough. And when you look at that back line, I mean, Alex Merrid, the goalkeeper, got play, player of the month for Juve last month. As soon as Chesney was back fit, he got straight back in the side. So that's a little bit bizarre. But you look at that back line and you think, well, it's quite, you know, it's quite strong, uh, lots of know-how, uh, really experienced players. And when you see Brahim Diaz's second goal today or, or Milan's second goal today, and it's a culture in Italy that it doesn't happen anywhere else, but the, the, the ultras of every single side or on most side have got an opinion, they've got a voice that can get to players, they can have meetings with managers and players and players take it on board. And fair play to uh, Benucci last week for sitting and having a conversation with the ultras about their performances. My word, he'll be going nowhere near them this week because he ducks out <laughs> of the most obvious 50-50 tackle you've ever seen in your lifetime. And he holds his hand up and Diaz just ghosts past him, but not even with any skill. It's just a lack of bottle from the captain. And then they score. So that is going to be a huge worry. Uh, you agree, Nicky? Yeah, it certainly wasn't a good night for, for Bonucci. It wasn't a good night for, for many people in the Juventus shirt. I mean, strangely, I thought in the first half it was quite a balanced game, reasonably competitive. Um, I'm not going to go down uh, Legri's post-game line where he said, well, we didn't give up that many chances except for the two goals, the two times Rafael Leal hit the post and every other chance he could list. But they certainly in the first half were, were in the game. But the, the second goal is is a calamity. It's, it's Vlavic giving the ball straight to um, to, to Brahim Diaz. And, and as, uh, as you've just been saying, you know, Diaz then basically runs straight past Benucci unchallenged until it's too late. So there's so much that feels off with Juventus at the moment. I, I know Nedved was saying in the week the thing that's missing is that sense of fight, that sense of, of bite that Juventus have had in the past. And I think there's definitely a yearning for the likes of Mario Mandzukic, who used to be there, or Carlos Tevez when he was there, those figures who really sort of brought a little bit of, of, of muscle and physicality up the pitch. And I think that's why they've been trying to get Milik into the starting eleven a bit more. But it goes beyond that for me. I think that the team has just been so bland, so insipid for a long time. And in the end, I've been a huge admirer of Allegri as well down the years. The buck does stop with him. Still, it takes two to tango, of course, Don. And a good response from Milan considering their performance midweek. Yeah, exactly that. Um, and they have got so many injuries, Dan. So that I think that had an effect on the Chelsea game midweek. But Theo Hernandez was back today. Uh, they look better. I mean, Rafa Liao was just an incredible footballer. He had a fantastic game, as usual. Uh, they looked pretty solid. Um, and, you know, the, get, the, the goal just before half-time give them a big boost going into half-time. The second goal, five, ten minutes after the, the second half, killed the game. There was no way Juve were coming back. But for, for wins and a, and a win and, a, and a, you know, a, a one that Milan needed um, just to try and keep pace with Napoli, who are flying this season, 
it was actually a must win for them. If they if the game had gone a draw, they might have just pointed and went, oh, you know, with the injuries, it's not a bad point. We'll take a point and then we'll move on to next week. But the fact that they get the win, that is a big, uh, a big win for them. Huge three points. Thank you very much for watching ESPN FC on YouTube. For more highlights, analysis and exclusive content, be sure to subscribe.